We were just discussing earlier about, you've been here a few weeks, we keep, we keep saying it's gone, well, I've only been here a week, two weeks. It's sort of now. Keep it on. Yeah, creep on. But still only four games, really, isn't it? Yeah. It's weird I'm, that it's... Yeah, the schedule we thought we were going to have early on has just been knocked back a little bit, I think. Um, obviously, with the postponement of both the, the Notts County and the Grimsby games, but both have been reassigned to dates probably earlier than we thought they were going to be. And I understand the league and their need to fill as, as quickly as they can the Tuesdays that aren't filled yet, because going forward, we don't know if there's going to be more games called off either for weather, because we haven't had any really bad weather yet, have we? Other than that Boxing Day rain. Um, but we haven't had the frosts and the snows yet. So from that point of view, I get the, the need and the want for all clubs to try and get their games in as quickly, but it's just moved a very um, brutal period at Christmas into a brutal period in January. Sure. Yeah, I mean, what it has done is it's given us time uh, as a staff um, and playing staff to get to know each other a little bit more. Um, the couple of trips we've had, inclusive of that, you know, when you spend more time with each other, you get to know each other as people off the pitch as well as on the pitch. So I'm very, very au fait with all of the players now. Um, and also it gives the lads who haven't been available to me a little bit more time to get closer. Whether they're closer to be picked yet is debatable, but they're certainly closer to being considered to be picked, so that's good. Um, the lads who had the COVID problems, and there's only been a couple to be fair, they've all now returned to train and touch wood, haven't shown any ill effects of such, so that's encouraging. Mm. And I've got to give the lads a bit of a pat on the back in terms of for all these big clubs who seem to be riddled with Covid mm -hmm. and getting games called off left, right and centre, we have been superb in, in, their, in their efforts to, you know, to, to stay clear of it, which is difficult because we don't know where it is, do we? Yeah. So um, from that point of view, I'm really delighted with the lads you know, sticking to their, their guns in that respect and uh, hopefully long may I continue. Not had anything this week? We haven't had any additionals, no. We've, right. Like I said, the, the lads who had it, which um, weren't available at Chesterfield, so you can work there now. Mm. They've all come back to train. Um, so, yeah, as, as of yet, and this morning when I walked in here, there was nobody reported positive this morning. Um, yeah, so we, we're good to go. What about, I'll, I'll, put, I'll lob them in together. What yeah. about the other injured? You've got Tyler Denton, um, is he closing in? or Closing in, I'm expecting him back into full training next Monday which is good so he'll do he'll need a full week's training before he's considered as you know so he, he might make he might make it around the squad at uh, south end um so that's something oh sorry yeah south end because he'll need a full week next week and there's in the midweek game after that so we'll see if i mean if he if he comes on quicker than is anticipated he might make next weekend at talking but at the minute i'm probably penciling in some sort of Involvement at South End at the earliest. And then Pierce and um, Michael, I think, were on that COVID But they were the guys on the COVID so, list, yes. Yeah. So him and, and AJ. So, but AJ got oh, yeah. back before yeah. the Chesterfield game. So, like I said, all three of them guys are reporting full clean bill of health. Kyle? Kyle McFadden, I had a good long chat with him on my own yesterday. Um, and I think this isn't a slant at anybody before me in any department, but I think he's probably played too early, being the kind of guy he is, um, and then he's returned to train too much. He should have been managed a little bit more because the kind of lad he is, he, want, he wears his heart on his sleeve, he's a warrior, I can see that. But I think now at his age, he realises he probably, he, he was part of it, making a decision to come back a little early, and it's put him back a little bit. But he isn't a million miles away, he might be a, a week or so behind Tyler. So with a bit of luck, whatever, the weekend after the South End game may be where we're looking to, to bring him Start back in the fold. Yeah, I mean, week. well, like I said, I think I said to you the very first time I sat in front of the camera, I'd be looking around tomorrow and I didn't know the five lads on the bench, they were the young boys. Now, tomorrow, I'm not only going to be looking around and knowing all of them because they probably have started in games for me already, but there'll be a couple of three in the stand, which I don't like doing, but we can only keep 11 really happy who start because the, the subs are never happy. <laughs> it's just one of, one of them things, but the 16 lads who are involved will be the 16 charged with getting us three points tomorrow. That doesn't mean the lads who are either in the stand or, or not, not considered for the, for the bench, that doesn't mean they won't be starting on Tuesday. We've got, like I said, it's going to be a brutal period for us now. It's Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday this week, 
and then very quickly after that it's Saturday, Friday, Tuesday, Saturday. So we've got lots of games coming up and I do believe everybody will can possibly make a start. When we were talking about the number of games, is it more difficult to assess your players just through training or do you need to watch them in games to get a better idea of their qualities? Depends what you're doing in training. I think we, as a staff, try to make our training as relative as we can to the next game. And that starts way before the players think it does. So when the game's finished, we're already looking at the opposition and thinking, you know, where are the little areas of weakness for them? Where are the real strengths? So we'll then, you know, accumulate sessions on the training ground that put pictures in the players' minds before we actually tell them what they're doing. So and then when we explain why we've done what we're doing or why we're doing what we're doing, then it sort of comes together. Well, that's the plan anyway. So the answer to your question is, I think the touch time in training is massively important because I've definitely got a different mindset, I think, to what was going on here before. Um, I'm more about structure and about responsibility as individuals, collectives, and then a group. Um, I think it was a little bit more freestyle before that. It's probably the best way to describe. So anybody who's watched us in the four games I've been here, I'd like to think can see a sort of pattern of what's happening. Definitely believe we're a more solid group as a collective because we haven't got any more solid individuals. They're the same guys, mm. but the team looks harder to beat. Mm. Now, people will argue we, we ain't scoring goals. Well, we weren't scoring goals before. At least we're not shipping a load of goals at this moment in time, touch wood. So, you know, we just got to get that, the blend right. You know, people who have been programmed, and I use that word deliberately, who've been programmed to play in a certain way for a certain period of time, it takes a long time to reprogram, you know, and I don't want to reprogram the whole lot because a lot of it's good. I said that when I walked in the door. They're a technically proficient group of players. They just needed to become a little bit more streetwise, a bit more Kyle McFadden, if you like. If we had three or four of them in the team with the mentality he's got, I could see the group being really strong because they're technically great. Um, so from that point of view, I don't want to say we're a million miles away because the chairman might shut his checkbook. <laughs> so I'll say we're a few million miles away. But now, we, at the end of the day, I'm happy with what I'm working with and I think we're getting the best out of the lads that we that we have available to us at the moment. We, we're eking everything we can out of them. Some of them will be able to maintain that level, some won't, because they have never done it before. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to sort of sniff and scratch and what have you and see where we're going with that and, and make decisions towards the end of the, the month as to whether we need to add. You said about firming up a bit, being a bit more solid. I mean, a lot of teams will not be able to go to Halifax and Chesterfield yeah. and get away with, not get away with, but get... No, no, you're right. That. Get away without getting a spanking. You're yeah. right. Yeah, you're right. Listen, them teams are on a different planet to us in terms of infrastructure and finance. And we, we know that. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to... It's like, you know, saying I'm allergic to dogs. The fact that I know I'm allergic to dogs means I know I'm going to sneeze when I come out of here, but I'm not going to moan about that because I sat down and there's a dog in the room. So <laughs> there's no good about moaning about something you already know. Um, we've got to work with the tools that we've got, and I'm doing that. Like I said, I think we're improving as we go. What we've got to do is we've got to keep... If we stick to the ratio we're doing at the minute, if we, if we won two, lost two, won two, lost two, we'd be fine. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, that is, that is certainly an improvement since before the day I walked in the door. Given you, you, you started your first game, you know, there was not much time to, to yeah. work with the team then, and then you've had those two big ones. Does that make this week's game a real, uh, uh, I'm going to say the biggest game, but they're all big games, I'm sure, but re a more realistic game to look at? The biggest game is always the next game, mm. it's as simple as that. That's we, what we, I tried to avoid yeah, saying. Yeah, I know you did. <laughs> we, 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 need, we need to make sure that we know what we're doing inside the building. Any, listen, one, in, one enemy inside the tent is worse than 10,000 enemies outside the tent. Simple as that. You know, we've got blokes all pulling in the same direction within the football club. That's from top to bottom, tail lady to chairman. So from my point of view, I'm really happy with the working environment that I'm, I'm in. I think we're making progress on the training ground. Therefore, we've made progress on the pitch. And that's evident, in, as far as I can see, despite two defeats, there was elements of both defeats that I really took um, pleasure from, being sadistic, if that's a word. But, but at the end of the day, football's about results, and we've got to make sure we get more positive results than not. And at the moment, we're on an even keel. Now, the difference being is the teams at the very top of the league are the two teams that have beat us. The, team that, the only team that are below us in the division, we've beaten. Now we're going to get the litmus test of the team that's right in the middle. So we're going to get a real taste of what this division's all about from top to bottom after tomorrow's game. So if you ask me on next Friday, what did I feel about that? Because 
then I'll be able to give you an honest answer. I'll do that. Um, you don't remember. That's probably very <laughs> true. <laughs> um, I think as well, you know, the, the fact that you've got two wins out of two on your belts here, that's nice for players to have that sort of target. Let's, let's have another one. Let's keep that going at home where it's, it's important you get wins and important you get the fans behind you and, and, and make this, I think it's a cliche, but make this a fortress, isn't it? Yeah, uh, at the end of the day, I'm not going to ask the players to do anything different to what they've given me in the last two games. That's a win. So it's not uncharted territory for them. It was when we faced Dover because they hadn't won yet for a, for a period. But now they have. The last time they played here, they won. And the time before that, they won. So it's in their head. And, you, and, and you know, it's like goal scorers going without goals for a period. You get out of a habit, but that feeling in the gut you get when you score a goal never, ever goes away. So when it comes, you remember it. You've got to hold it. It's the same with winning football matches as a group of people, staff, players. You much prefer that feeling in the pit of your stomach when the final whistle goes and you're winning by a goal as opposed to losing by a goal. So, like you said, it is a cliche, but ultimately, they know what's required. They know how to deliver it. When they cross that white line, as much as if you listen to me, you think, I can't affect it, I can affect it. You can't affect it too much, but you can affect certain incidences and certain individuals more than others. And we as a staff believe we know the strengths of each and every individual we've got here. And like I said, we'll be, we'll be trying to make sure we do what we can and then what they can to bring three points back. Just to my memory now, but a week ago we were talking about possible incoming. Mm -hmm. So I guess this time of the year we need to ask, how, is there any progress on any incomings? There's always progress. I mean, the window is a bit of a falsity in, in this, le at this level of football, in my opinion, because ultimately the, the likelihood of us signing somebody from a first team arena in a football league club is far fetched because with all due respect it's not somewhere where players of that ilk are going to look to make their next move so are we going to bring players in just to make numbers up now well i want to bring players in that are going to improve the team and then the bench so the bench will get improved by the people on the pitch unfortunately if that happens so the people that i bring in will likely to play because I'll see things in them that I don't think we've quite got in the building. That doesn't mean I don't think the lads in the building have got the right attributes, it's just different attributes. Um, so the answer to your question is yes, there's always progress because it's, it's a fluid situation. Recruitment, it doesn't start when, an, when a window opens. Recruitment finishes when the window opens, but that's only if you know what you're doing when you're recruiting. Mm. If you just open a book of, and say who's available, oh, we like him because he was good against us last week or last year, that's not the way we're going to be recruiting here anymore. We're going to be doing a lot more diligence, a lot more, you know, away from the public eye. There's a lot more work going on than people think. So, yeah, there's phone calls going on. There's conversations going on. There's interest being logged at many levels with many different players in many different positions. But we'll be in a pecking order because there'll be other... If we think they're good players, and my staff think they're good players, sure as eggs as eggs. Other clubs higher, higher up the pyramid than us will also think they're good players. So... It's going to be one of them where we're not going to throw the world at a player and think he's going to change the world. There's a statistic. I think at this stage of the season, at every level, a change, dramatic change in your squad will make about less than 10% improvement in your result. So from that point of view, and people think you're going to wipe a load out and bring a load in, it ain't happening. Newcastle could and they won't. There you go. <laughs> well, presumably, you, you bring a load of players in, you've got to start that thing again. Yeah. You said about changing playing yeah. style takes time. Yeah. Well, unless we sign the whole of Chesterfield's team and come and expect them to do for Kings Lynn what they're doing for Chesterfield, then mm. that can't happen, can it? Like I said, Newcastle could buy any player in the world, mm. and lots of them, but they won't, because right. there's a structure there and that, that'll change. Are they going to buy Todd Campbell? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. I tried to buy Tom, Todd Campbell when he was a free. <laughs> but for who? Country. Really? Yeah, we got offered him on a free loan. Yeah. Yeah, done well, man. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, you can't help looking outside and hearing the weather forecast saying there's going to be frost. I mean, it looks lovely now, actually. Um, but it's a bit damp. There's going to be frost. We've got covers coming on. We've got a game Saturday and a game on Tuesday. Yeah, uh, I mean, let's is, get is it. Is your fingers crossed or no, are you happy with it? No, let's get it right. It was a perfect storm or an unperfect storm yeah. on, on, on Boxing Day, it was nobody individual's fault. You know, if people believe there's a man in the sky, it was his fault. Because at the end of the day, a, a bucket load of rain literally come down in, on it, and it, it drenched us. I realised driving into the ground that day it was going to be touch and go, simply because all the ditches at the side of the road were up here with water. So we had a, a, you know, an unseasonable amount of rain 
fall in a very short period. So I know the club's taken a stick for that, but let's put that to one side. At the end of the day, I know everybody at this club will be working, you know, morning, noon and night to make sure that what we can do to get the game on. As far as I'm concerned, yesterday morning at 10 o'clock, that game would have been off because it was hard frozen. Mm. But on the advice of the people who look after the pitch and chatting to me, I've said, look, get, it, get them on as quickly as we can. So they'll be going on tonight, uh, this afternoon. So if there's a hard frost, it won't happen. And if there's a load of rain, it won't get on the pitch. Mm. So we're going to do the best we can to make sure, but we can only control what we can control. If the man upstairs decides to drop a deluge on us at half past two and the pitch gets flooded, mm. we can't do much about it. So the game will be on. Get yourself along, come and watch it. But that's again that fortress thing. If, you, if yeah. you're defending a, a hundred percent record under you, yeah. the game's on. Absolutely. Saturday afternoon. That's the only Listen, one place, isn't it? I believe there was just under a hundred people travelled on New Year's Day, mm. which is difficult for a, a fan. I know that they're not getting paid to travel; they pay to travel, and we were really appreciative because I've got to say. For six and a half thousand people in the ground, I could hear them. I could hear our 95. So from that point of view, that big thank you to them. What they need to do is bring 10 of their mates mm. and bring them in and have the same noise here. And listen, like I said, I don't want to say it too many more times, but I've seen this place rock and I, and I just feel certainly Saturday, we'd definitely be in the, in, in the majority in terms of numbers to away fans. But on Tuesday night, I challenge us to have more people than them because whether it's Tuesday or Saturday, Notts County are a monster club mm -hmm. and they'll bring people to watch their, their football team. So I want the people of Kings Lynn to come out and watch theirs. Uh, Ruby. <laughs> um, if I could just start off, obviously we know you had Hugo as, as one of your coaching team. Mark, a little, little bit of information about Mark, his, his background. Mark, Mark I signed as a player when he was 30. Three, I believe, 32, 33. Mark's played football league and high levels of semi-pro football all his life. Um, and I signed him. Uh, I'd, every time I played against him, he was one of them blokes that I didn't like. Not as a player, as a manager. He always got up my nose. Um, so he was one of them where I thought, you know what, I could do with one of them in my team at Eastbourne because we were really nice. So actually, if he was about three or four years younger, he'd probably be signing a playing contract because he's definitely the type of player that would benefit this group of players. Hence, he's here as a coach because he's, his mindset and his approach to the game hasn't changed. You just can't get around the pitch as much as you used to get around. So he's a guy who I know the traits and the fibre of the bloke are very similar to me. So he's already tasted being um, a first-team coach, albeit at one level down, and I thought... You know, he's fairly local to us. I know him well. Hugo knows him well. We've worked together, albeit he was a player with, under our staff. Um, and I think, I've got to say, in the first week, he's been very impressive on the training ground. You have to ask the players whether they like what he does, but I do. So from that point of view, he'll, he'll be staying, I hope. And, how, I mean, how important to you is that you've got a good structure underneath yourself, you know, from the coaching staff? Down, downwards, you know, through to the for the academy, and mm -hmm. you know how how important. It's massively yeah. important. I mean, in the longer term, I would like to think I'll have a, have an effect in all of that. But in the very short term, it's my name above the door. But I expect everybody, players inclusive, to treat Hugo and Mark exactly like they treat me. You know, I'm not above them in that respect. They're they're with me, we're shoulder to shoulder, and we're shoulder to shoulder with the players. Obviously, there's a hierarchy because I'm the manager, one's the assistant manager, one's the first team coach, but. They deserve and will command the, the same respect that I get. So if I walk in the room, I know what happens. It usually goes quiet, you know, because they don't want to hit the manager to hear. That will probably not happen as much with them because they'll be a little bit more friendly. But then, you know, then as far as like I said, as far as I'm concerned, when they walk in the room, it's like me walking in the room. We've spoken obviously about the possibility of new, new faces coming in. You did have two new faces in the team last week, mm -hmm. um, and. How do you feel they, their, their performances went? I thought they did really well. They did exactly what I asked them to do. Um, it's, it's never easy putting two new players in the pitch, moving another player from a position he has been playing in somewhere else, i.e. Ethan, move from the back line to the middle line. So from that point of view, it was a real restructure of a team in a week. Now, the two lads who came in had trained that all week and had fitted in fairly seamlessly, to be honest with you, and they were the right people for that game in them positions with the game plan that we had. They're both disciplined, they're both fit, and they're both aggressive in the game. One's aggressive in and out of possession, one's aggressive in possession. So from that point of view, 
we, we felt they were the right guys at the right time. So whether they play every minute of every game, like any player, is debatable. But they didn't do a lot last week to dissuade the fact that we'd made the right decision with them. And on the new faces, I would like to think Mark's going to have as much influence as a new face around the building as any new player will, because he's going to affect every player, whereas a player coming in really wants to affect himself, because he's either coming here to show he's good enough where he's coming from, or he's coming here to earn a contract. So he doesn't have to do that. He's here because I want him here, and he will affect. So that addition is as important as a new player. You handed Aaron Jones a captain's armband. Yeah. Well, I didn't, actually. Hugo did. Oh, right. <laughs> a, bit, a bit hastily as well, I've got to say. It's, I mean, obviously, you, you were without Michael Clunan, but yeah. is Jonah the type of player you see you could see as a, as a future captain? Or him, him or Kyle, even? Kyle Callum McFadden? Well, I can't... I can't I mean, speaking to Kyle off the pitch, you can see that he's a, he's a man. You know, he's a married man with children, for one, so he's, he's, he's got more experience than most of the players. So I could imagine, you know, Kyle would have no problem wearing an armband. But I've got to say, both Jonah and Michael Clunan, and one or two others, I've got to be honest, um, have shown me leadership qualities. Because, you know, when, when, when the handover happened, there wasn't a lot of people around the building. So I had to lean on one or two people. And I will never go and ask players and ask their opinion about other players. But I did get a steer on one or two things around the football club from one or two of the players. And I've got to say, none of them have given me a bum steer. They've all given me honest answers, them two inclusive. And, you know, very quickly you can see lads who aren't worried about talking to their manager. And some lads are, talk, like, not worried about talking to the manager, but aren't as comfortable talking to somebody who's in charge of them, let's say. And them two aren't. Obviously, they have, they've got lives outside of how that probably aid that as well, them two, because they've been in that that sphere of football more than the other lads. The other lads have all come from academies or, you know, development football where it's very much a hierarchical thing and you are down here in a football club. Michael and Jonah have been at the pinnacle of their levels of football wherever they've played. Is that fair? Yeah. So they're not they're not phased talking to me, which is great, which is great. There was a lot of talk after the game last week, Ross Barras, people thought he had he was magnificent last mm-hmm. week. He's, I, I, you, you're quite blessed with him because he can play anywhere, can't he? Really for you? Um, yeah, I mean he's only played in one position so far yeah. for me, like. But yeah, no. Uh, listen, I'm aware of that. I mean, again, Ross is another one. He, he his demeanour and his enthusiasm around the place and on the training ground bodes well for us as a group of people. So from that point of view, I don't like picking out individuals. I thought the whole, honestly, I thought the whole. Makes me laugh, you know, you pick up the non-league, and I, don't, and I don't do this, somebody told me this. Somebody picked up the non-league and says, they all got eights and sevens, we all got sixes. I said, well, hold on a minute, these should have won six or seven nil, but they didn't. So we should have been getting the sevens and eights because we were the team that flipped the form. We were 13 to one to win that game and lost one nil. These should have, these should have, could have, <laughs> or would have thought, and the best compliment we got, with all due respect, was off Mrs. Rowe. James's wife. I was sitting in the office after the game and she came in with the baby to see her husband to say well done, which was brilliant. And she went, oh, I didn't enjoy that. And I went, thank you very much. And she said, oh, sorry. I went, no, no, that's a real compliment to me in a backhanded sort of way. And she went, well, it wasn't as comfortable as I thought it was going to be. And that, for me, was the best compliment we could get. And James <laughs> went, you shouldn't have said that. And I went, that's brilliant. We had a little bit of a chat and a cup of tea in that one, yeah. We've spoken about every game is critical, every game is big, obviously because of the situation the club are in at the moment. The home games though, how important are they? I mean you you want to try you want to win every game of football, but your home games especially they you you know you you want to be getting on a run here, don't you? Well we're on one. We've had two games yeah. we won two, so from that point of view it's listen, it's one of them, rinse and repeat. I, I'm not gonna ask the players to do I may be asking them to do things slightly tactically different against different opposition, but I'm not ultimately all I ever all I ever ask them to do with five to three and twenty to eight is lads go and win me one game. That's all I want, one game. I don't want to worry about the next game or the next game or the fifteen down the road or Grimsby away in three Tuesdays time or whatever it is. We got to win this game, and if we don't win this game, we try and win the next game. I can't be any more simple than that. And it isn't a cliche; it's fact. Every football manager or coach will tell you the exact same thing. You start think. Do you think I'm a bleed quotist here? But <laughs> Roman proverb: Never chase two rabbits because you'll catch none. 
You can only chase one at a time. So if you chase one rabbit, you might catch it. If you chase two, you never catch any of them. So we could go after the rabbit every weekend and try and get them three points. Until we, that is not achievable to us that Saturday, then we look at the next game. But we won't have any focus on anything until... I've got to say, James said it last week. He got Chelsea this week, but he, in quite rightly, he picked his strongest team to try and cement his place at the top of this division first. He just did it slightly less emphatically than he thought he would have done. And I, I, I imagine you, you're not an individual who's... Do, do, do you set targets? Do you have a points target in your head, what you need to do, or...? You'll never know what's in my head. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. No. Not publicly, I won't know, because all you're doing there is setting, you're setting things to fail at. And at the end of the day, like I said, every game I enter into, there's three points. We have, three, we have a point in my pocket every time we walk onto the pitch. It's up to us to add two to it or let them take one away or we come back with a point. That's it. So for every game between now and the end of the season, you can work that out. That's the minimum requirement. That will not be enough. We need to have more positive results than negative results. And I don't see why we can't with the start we've had and the progress we're making. And I, I imagine if you start saying to the players, I want 20 points in the next seven, eight games, that can actually put pressure on them, can't it? Yeah, like I said, again, I'm reiterating what I've, regurgitating what I've said earlier in the interview. You can't worry about what you can't affect. And we can't affect the Notts County game today or tomorrow. We can on, at five o'clock on Saturday. We can, you know, I mean, the staff <coughs> have spoken about things, about certain players who will play tomorrow won't be physically capable of playing again on Tuesday, simply because of their recent history, whether it's COVID, whether it's injury, whether it's age, fatigue, whatever it is, we're measuring all that that you guys don't see. So it's not just a case of, we haven't got favourites, there's no favouritism going on in there. People are getting picked on the pitch and on the bench because they're the right people at the right time for one game, that's all. One final question. Um, <coughs> one player who came here I think it's back November time. We haven't actually seen him in a Lynn shirt yet, Barris. <coughs> what, how uh, is he any closer to to fitness? He had a foot problem, I believe. Yeah, he's in, he's injured, and he's not training with the group or hasn't yet trained with the group. So I haven't seen him in a football context. He's around the building, obviously, because he's getting treatment and stuff of Carol. But other than that, we um, I haven't seen him play football yet. I've looked at the <coughs> reports on him before he came to the club, um, so I know what he is. So, yeah. But other, other than that, there's a couple like, like Ty, who's just come back from Lowestoft. I haven't, I haven't seen him play football yet because he's been at Lowestoft. Now he's back in our group and he's going to train for the first time today, actually. So there's a couple of, couple of three of them that I'm, I'm still unaware of what they're like on a football pitch. Kyle McFadden, for instance. I haven't seen him on a football pitch since I came to the club, um, or Tyler Denton, but I know them. I know their history and I know where they, you know, where they played and stuff. So from that point of view, I'm, we're still turning up rocks and seeing things scurry out of there, aren't we? But, but they're, they're all much closer because of the break-in games. Yeah. Mm.